biology is becoming an increasingly quantitative science. I mean, it used to be that you, you, you were an expert on one molecule and you studied this to the day that you died and you knew everything about it, but a lot of the studies were very qualitative. Now we want to know how much, when, where, how do I modify it, how do I manipulate it. So this kind of sounds a lot like engineering. What we're attempting to do is to develop methodologies that uh, change the way people discover drugs. And we have two kind of parallel approaches. Uh, one of which is much more along the lines of a traditional drug dis computational discovery approach where basically you have a target. Most drugs target proteins, not all, but most. They're small molecules and what you want to do is just find an inhibitor of a protein that can modify, therefore modify its action. You want to make it go up. An agonist, antagonist, turn it up, turn it down. And in principle you could screen millions of compound libraries and this is what's traditionally been done. But the reality is the success rate is so low that if one were to design computer chips at the success rate of drug discovery, we wouldn't even have pocket calculators. Now, designing drugs is actually much harder than building a computer chip because you have a very complicated biological system and ultimately you don't want to kill the system, us. You don't want to kill the target, the, bac the bacteria, the virus, whatever. And so the issue becomes how can one accelerate this process? And we've been developing algorithms where we use uh, approaches to predict the target, the protein. Now a protein adopts a well-defined three-dimensional shape uh, given its amino acid sequence. This is the so-called protein folding problem. And one of the things which we've been doing and burning up lots of computer cycles on is, is actually trying to predict the structure. Now unfortunately the reality is, is you cannot predict the perfect structure. If we could, which would be indistinguishable from experiment, then one wouldn't have to do experiments. So what one can do for a given proteome, the entire complement of proteins in us or your friendly bacteria or uh, whatever, is we can now produce low resolution structures for about 70% uh, of them. And then the question becomes, are these just interesting artifacts or can they actually have biological utility? And so getting on the question of why you need supercomputers for that is because these calculations take hundreds of thousands of days of computer time to complete to march through a proteome. And so if you want to do more than one, and we've actually done this for all sequence proteomes at this point, it sets the scale for the kind of problems you're doing. Now when you have an approximate structure, which is what comes out of these algorithms, can you actually use it for ligand screening? And in collaboration with a very talented uh, uh, person in my group, Michael Belinsky, we've developed an algorithm which basically copies from evolution. Uh, the insight is, is you don't have to have evolutionarily close proteins. You can actually get a lot of data from evolutionarily distant proteins. They will tell you the general class of molecules that bind, the general features of the molecules that bind, what is absolutely necessary for binding and what is variable. And one can then imagine doing this not on one protein, but on the entire collection of proteins. And so when you want to design drugs, what you want to be able to do is have an approach which can actually screen for the target or targets you care about and away from everything else, so positive and negative design. And so this is one stretch strain which we're doing and we've gotten some potentially very encu encouraging results on HIV protease, on malaria and a number of other cases. So that's one strain of the algorithms we're developing. There's a second strain of the algorithms we're developing, uh, Adrian, we as Adrian Arakaki and John McDonald and his research group, where we're uh, combining gene expression data in diseased versus normal tissues, in this case cancer, and asking a very simple question. If we look at all the enzymes which basically produce molecules, the small molecules in your cell that are produced biologically are called metabolites, and we see metabolites that are downregulated, that is to say predicted to be deficient in the disease state relative to normal. These are very interesting. And the reason that they're very interesting is a very na a naive idea is, well, perhaps the they're fact that they're in deficit is a cause of the disease. It could also be a consequence of the disease. So if it's a consequence of the disease, it's not what you want to do because if the body is responding by trying to decrease the level and you add it, you die. But suppose it's actually the converse. The body is caused by the def deficit. You know, there's vitamin C deficiencies. For example, you might have heard a lot about this. Uh, vitamin D is an example of an essential metabolite whose absence uh, or reduced levels in children is a major problem in the United States. And also, it's been it's def deficiencies have been implicated in colon cancer and uh, breast cancer. 
And so one very simple thing is just take a vitamin D tablet every day and you reduce the statistical incidence of cancer. Well, we've developed a general computational methodology which identifies metabolites that are down predicted to be downregulated and those that are predicted to be upregulated. And so one might imagine that either alone or in combination, these are interesting targets, especially the ones that are downregulated, because it suggests that either them or a modification of the metabolite could have potential anti-cancer therapy. So where we are now is, is before you go to a mouse, which is an ex relatively expensive, before you get to a person, which counts, what you do is, is you study cell lines. And so it's kind of a necessary but not sufficient condition. And we have computationally identified metabolites that in the case of a childhood leukemia-derived cell line, JERCAT cell lines, can drop the proliferation rate to 10%. So by NCI standards, these would be interesting leads for drugs. Now, JERCAT is an interesting case because it's very permissive. And it's very responsive. And so the cynic would say, well, every metabolite contributes to it. Well, if that's true, then we've discovered nothing. Well, that's not the case. So you, you test guys that are predicted to be upregulated, and the majority of them have no effect. The other hypothesis is, is I give you the metabolite, and it's like adding high sulfuric acid to it. Yes, the proliferation rate is low because it kills the cell. It also kills you. Uh, so, so again, you have to show that the response is specifically targeted towards disease states relative to normal. And in the JERCAT cell line, we've done that. And another example, so that's a very responsive cell line we have done OFCAR3. OFCAR3 is ovarian cancer. Now, ovarian cancer is a particularly vicious disease because it's asymptomatic. By the time you find that you've got it, and it's typically after six months of initial complaints, uh, the survival rates are very low. And so we're taking a particular recalcitrant cell line, OFCAR3 cell lines, which doesn't particularly like anything, actually, in terms of its response. And there are uh, proliferation rates. We've only tested four compounds. Half of them dropped the proliferation rates to about 50%. So we've kind of, in, in these initial stages, bracketed the studies of very permissive leukemia cell line and very unfriendly OFCA3. And the results are very encouraging, so now we're going to test all cell lines. Asthma is an inflammatory response, and if, a, if you suffer from asthma, you'd really like to have a treatment. A lot, of the a lot of the treatments for this inflammatory response are actually metabolites that, that reduce it. Now, we can predict them by the same analysis. And so you have very diverse diseases, cancer and asthma, that you can identify compounds that are number significant. In this case, they're actually uh, being used. And we can go through then, and you can imagine applying this to heart disease or to all the types of cancer, or in principle, any disease this methodology should be applicable to. Before I die, I'd like to simulate a cell starting from molecular detail. I mean, if you do the calculation, I mean, a typical liver cell has 10 million protein molecules. Okay. So if I wish to simulate 10 million protein molecules at a uh, petabyte per snapshot and I want to simulate 10 to the 12th snapshot, I can't even store the data. Much less the fact that at the best calculations can simulate individual molecules for microseconds. I want to simulate tens of millions of molecules for seconds. And so the time scales are rough. So one's going to need ever-increasing supercomputing power to be able to do this. You know, the key real is, really is, at least from our point of view, is I'd like to understand that nobody does. What takes a normal cell and turns it into a cancer cell on a molecular level? Is it just simply kind of processes that were nascent in development get, that get turned on again? Or is it more a question of amplification? You're turning some stuff, the gain up and the gain of others down? We really don't understand these things. And in order to be able to do these things, since this is tens of millions, if not billions, of molecules on 12 orders of magnitude in space and time, uh, when this, you can't do it without a supercomputer. I mean, you can't even do it without the next generation supercomputers. And so what one typically does is you kind of bootstrap your way up and you say, well, what is the class of problems that I can barely do now using contemporary resources and not having an infinite budget? And that, then that's what we're attempting to do. The thing that I'm most excited about is this cancer metabolomic stuff. Because if it works, it's a, it could be a general methodology for the treatment of disease. If it doesn't work, it's an interesting idea. Possibly we can accelerate the drug discovery process and drop the cost of it. Because right now you can spend up to a billion dollars per drug and the success rate is very low. And even if it succeeds, there will be a fraction of the population which may experience significant side effects. And so one wants to develop personalized medicine approaches, which is exactly what we're doing. 
on the computer as prior authorization. The other thing is, is if this cancer metabolomics or this metabolomics idea pans out and we need to demonstrate it, it could also again suggest novel treatments which will intrinsically have less side effects because the advantage of the biologically occurring molecules is they're biologically occurring. And so there are mechanisms for clearance, transport, it minimizes side effects because they're already floating around in your cell. So one could imagine, and I'm going to again adopt the typical mantle of a scientist in 10 to 20 years, this could change the way people are treated, but we have to prove it. I mean, that's the burden of us. You know, unfortunately, there's these ugly experiments which keep getting in the way of these beautiful theories. But potentially, it could change the way drug discovery is done and treatment is done.